I guess I'll go ahead and get started. You have no idea how hard it is to stand up here when you want to start teaching when there's silence in the auditorium. But, uh, so 8.59, that's, that's close enough. Um, so we're going to be in Revelation chapter 9 uh, this morning. Uh, quickly, just I guess as a sort of a, bit of a summary, we talked about uh, the book of Revelation written to give Christians, the saints, hope in the face of Roman persecution at the end of the first century. Uh, and then, of course, the principles of the book would continue. If you're uh, being um, persecuted in the second century by Diocletian, who was another Roman emperor that persecuted a lot of people, the same message would give you hope. But we looked at how in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and in chapter 22, 6 through 10, four times we're told that the things written in the vision are soon to come. They're shortly to come to pass, right? They're near. And so uh, chapter 1 is basically an introduction uh, it basically gives you the, the message. It's from Jesus himself, given to John, while he's uh, exiled for the word of God, for preaching the truth on the Isle of Patmos, which was uh, off the coast of Asia Minor near the city of Ephesus, uh, which where the letter to the Ephesians is written. Uh, and then chapters 2 through 3 talk about the seven churches that represent all churches and the different situations they were in. Some had good things that were said about them, some had bad. Chapters 4 and 5 you're given a vision uh, into the throne room of God, right? All this is a vision, so a lot of symbolic language. And there's a scroll that God the Father has in his right hand, and John's crying because nobody can take the scroll to tell them what the message inside of it is. And then here comes Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who comes on to the scene, takes the scroll out of God the Father's hand, and un unleashes the seven seals, and you start to have the message revealed. Um, chapter 6, you had the beginning of the first set of judgments, which were the seven what? Seven seals, okay? The first four uh, we talked about were the four horses, okay? Taken from an Old Testament minor prophet, Zechariah. And they talked about war, civil war, famine, and death. Uh, and then you had these, uh, the seals about, the fifth one was the, the martyrs, the Christians uh, who had died for their faith. And they were basically asking God, how much longer are you going to put up with this? And God says, a little while longer. Um, while God's giving those people, the, the Roman people, a chance to repent. The sixth one talks about cosmic disturbances, which is Old Testament language about the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give its light, uh, the moon will be turned to blood, right? All these different uh, prophetic language talking about how Rome is going to be punished, okay? Then in chapter 7, we looked at the 144,000, which is a figurative number, to represent God's people that he's marked for protection. Uh, in the Old Testament books like Ezekiel, Whenever God was going to punish uh, sinful Israel, what did he do first spiritually to the faithful people? He marked them. And it was this idea of, hey, look, you know, the punishment God's bringing is intended for the wicked people, not for the innocent. Now, that doesn't mean innocent people sometimes don't get caught up as collateral damage, as we'll see in the book. But, but that's not God's purpose, right? And so then uh, in chapter 8, we looked at the uh, seventh seal which like the Russian dolls, like you have like the seven seals and the seventh seal opens up with seven more trumpets, okay? And so last week we looked at uh, the trumpets, the first four trumpets were natural disasters, okay? It was like, it's sort of, the, the first four are on the land, which affects man, right? It's not on man, but it affects the things. And then the fifth one, which you're going to see uh, here in chapter nine, is going to be locusts from this bottomless pit, all right? It's figurative language. Uh, but it's going to talk about this punishment on people, but it's not going to kill them. That's going to be the sixth trumpet, right? So we're going to talk a lot about locusts today. Uh, there's some information maybe that I think would help us. Uh, how many people in here like have experienced a locust plague in your life? Many people. It's, this is not something we experience here, right? I want to read you an excerpt from a book I have, and this is talking about a locust plague uh, in the Bible lands. Okay, There's a guy that lived there for... 40, 50 years, and he experienced a locust plague. And it's about a page in the book, so it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but just I want you to have this in your mind, okay? He says this, um, Early in the spring, the locusts appeared in considerable numbers along the seacoast on the lower parts of the mountains. They did no great injury at the time, and having laid their eggs, they immediately disappeared. The local people who were familiar with their habits looked with anxiety to the time when those eggs would be hatched. Nor were their fears groundless or exaggerated. For several days previous to the 1st of June, we had heard that thousands of young locusts were on their march up the valley towards our village. And at length, I was told that they had reached the lower part of our village. Summoning all the people I could collect, 
we went to try and meet and attack them, hoping to stop their progress altogether. So this guy and all these people in the village take up weapons to go and try and what? Stop these locusts, because they know what the locusts are going to do to their crops if they get to the village, okay? He said, so summoning all the people I could collect, we, meant to, we went to meet and attack them, hoping to stop their progress, or at least turn aside the line of their march, get them to change directions. He said, never will I lose the impression produced by my first view of them. I had often passed through clouds of flying locusts, but these now we were confronted with did not have wings. They were about the size of full-grown grasshoppers, and they closely resembled them in appearance, but their number was astounding. The whole face of the mountain approaching us was black with them. They came like a disciplined army. We dug trenches and burnt fires and beat and burnt to death heaps upon heaps of them, but our effort was useless. They charged up the mountainside, climbed over the rocks, the walls, our ditches and hedges, and those behind them covered up and passed over the masses we had already killed and burned. After a long and fatiguing contest, we descended up the mountain to examine at length their column, but we could not even see the end of it out of view. Others told us the place that they occupied was 10 to 12 miles long and 4 to 5 miles wide. Wearied by our hard-fought battle, we returned and gave over the vain effort to stop their progress for that day. By the next morning, the head of their column had reached my garden, and I hired eight or ten people, and I resolved to rescue at least my flowers and vegetables. During the day, we succeeded by using fire and beating the locusts off the walls with bushes and branches to try to keep our little tiny garden tolerably clear of them. It was appalling to watch that irresistible army as it marched up the road and ascended the hill above my house. At length, worn out with our incessant skirmish, we gave up. We carried the pots that we could into the house and covered up what we were able to. We surrendered the rest of the conquerors, and for four days, they passed through our village towards the east, until finally only a few stragglers of the mighty hosts were left. In every stage of their, their existence, they gave a most impressive view of the power of God to punish a wicked world. Observing the pioneers of the host, those were the flying squadrons that appeared in the early spring. No power of man can interrupt them. Thousands on thousands deposited their innumerable eggs in the plain in the desert. This done, they vanished into the morning mist, but in six to eight weeks, the very dust seemed to wake into life and begins to creep. Soon the animated earth becomes minute grasshoppers, creeping and jumping all in the same general direction. While on their march, they consumed every green thing on their expedition. There was a large vineyard and vegetable garden adjoining ours that was green as a meadow in the morning, but by that night it was bare as a newly plowed field or dusty road. The noise made by them in marching and foraging was like that of a heavy shower falling upon a distant forest. So sometimes we don't understand what locust plagues are like, but to those in the Bible lands, who this is written to who? People in the Bible lands, right? Locust uh, plagues were a big deal. They basically, for like this guy said, four miles wide. Uh, the BBC did a program on locusts I watched, I don't know, maybe two years ago. They said they can sometimes be up to like 40, or I don't know if it's 40, billions upon billions of locusts in one plague, right? They wipe out everything, okay? Um, in the Old Testament, Books like Joel. Turn your Bibles to Joel. Let's, let's read a Joel passage before we start. Joel's a minor prophet, and as we've gone through this book, we've shown that a lot of the language of Revelation is taken from where? The Old Testament, that's right. So go to Joel chapter 2. I'm going to read Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Okay, blow the trumpet. What? What do you think this represents? A trumpet. We talked about it last week. A warning, right? A trumpet is something you blow as a warning. In the book of Ezekiel, it talked about if you see an enemy approaching, you're supposed to blow the trumpet to warn the people, okay? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Uh, skip down to verse 3. A, a fire devours before them, Behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them and behind a desolate wilderness. All right, this is figurative language. It's saying when this locust plague comes, and in this book it's representing the Babylonian army, right? Whenever they come, it's like what before they get there? Garden of Eden. It's perfect. And what about after they leave? It's desolate. There's nothing there, okay? Uh, go to verse 4. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, like swift steeds they run, with a noise like chariots, over mountaintops they leap, like the noise of flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Okay? We could continue to read. Go back to chapter 1 now. Uh, 
The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, verse 1, okay? He warns them, then look at verse 4. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the, the consuming locust has eaten. Verse 6. A nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are like the teeth of a lion. He has fangs of a fierce lion, okay? Now, if you want to go back and read the whole book of Joel, uh, you can. We don't really have time. But what I want to show you is in Revelation chapter 9, as we get into it, um, John is, is really looking at visions that are given using this language from, from the Old Testament, specifically Joel, okay? So this idea of an invading army is coming, but God's going to compare them to two animals, one like a swarming locust, okay? And the second one he's going to compare them to like war horses, all right, arrayed for battle. In the Old Testament, it was talking about Babylon, but we're going to be looking at a different nation here in Revelation chapter 9. So let's go ahead and get into Revelation chapter 9. I know that was a lot of background, but I think it'll help us understand the book a little bit better. Okay. So Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. The fifth angel sounded. He sounded his what? His trumpet. Okay. He sounded his trumpet. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Okay. So this trumpet of warning is sounded. Okay, now these are judgments upon what nation? Rome, okay? Now, a star fallen from heaven to the earth. What does this represent? Um, there's lots of Old Testament figurative language talking about a star fallen from heaven. Um, some people think that this, there's really, I'd say, two main positions I've seen in different people that hold views in this chapter. One is they think that this star fallen would be the devil, right? Satan, okay? Uh, because... It seems like he's going to be opening the bottomless pit. I don't know that I technically take that position. I have a lot more in my notes. Uh, I think this is a mighty angel that is given the power to open the bottomless pit. Okay? My reasoning is that um, in chapter 20, Satan is basically bound back into the pit, and it seems like there's an angel that has the keys. Right. So I don't really know that I want to spend too much time on who this angel actually is, whether it's good or evil. Um, but let's just keep moving, and as we go through, maybe we'll make some more some more comments about it. Okay. So a star fallen from heaven to the earth to him. So the star is referencing a what? A him. Yeah. Some sort of angel. Okay. Given the key to the bottomless pit. Okay. I have a lot more notes in here. Is this Satan? Is this the angel of God? I have a lot of different scriptures that people who take both positions have given. So if you want to do more reading on that, you can check that out in the notes. Okay. Verse two. And he, this angel, Open the bottomless pit, and smoke rose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because the smoke of the pit. Verse 3. Then out of the smoke, what comes on the earth? Locusts come on the earth. To them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Okay? I have a lot more Old Testament references in the notes that we're not going to cover because I think we've already done a decent job talking about locusts. Okay? But if you want to read more about that you can. Uh, Jeremiah talked about the Medo-Persian army. He compared them as lo to locusts, just like Joel compared Babylon to locusts. So it's an Old Testament idea of locusts are like, when this invading army comes, it's going to be like a swarm of locusts. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay. Uh, look at verse 4. They were commanded, okay, the locusts, not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who have the what? the seal of God on their foreheads, okay? So you can see in verse 4, these aren't literal locusts because they're, done, they're what? They're commanded, okay? So they're commanded not to harm the grass or earth or anything, but only to harm the men who don't have the seal of God uh, on their foreheads, okay? Remember in Revelation chapter 7, uh, there's sort of a pattern in the book if you kind of go back and look. You have these judgments pronounced, and then right before the final judgment, of like the final seal is given, you have this sort of interlude where God says, you know, maybe if there's a Christian that's reading this and getting nervous, God says, no, wait a minute, let me reassure you that you're going to be what? Protected. Revelation 7, right? They had a mark. So here, you've gone through the trumpets, and then before you get to the seventh trumpet, you're going to have these, basically, these interludes about people that are protected, okay? So verse 4, you're only to harm those who are not protected by God, okay? Look at verse 5. They were not given authority to kill them, so we're talking about the locusts now, they're not given authority to kill the people, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. 
So these locusts are not given the authority to kill the Roman Empire, these people yet. They're just going to what? Torment them for five months. All right. What's the, what's the significance of five months? I've heard two, are two points made. Uh, one is some people say five months is the length of a locust life. So they say that's how long a locust lives from the time it's born to the time it dies. Um, I've looked that up on, like, you know, the Internet, and it seems to be right. The second thing is uh, what is one of the numbers that's represented completeness in the book? Seven is one. Ten is one, okay? Um, so five is half of what? Ten. In the book, you'll see like seven years is a perfect number. Three and a half is like an imperfect, like an indefinite number, okay? So 10 is a whole number. Is five supposed to show that this is not complete final judgment, just partial judgment? You're going to see that that's true. Whether that's what the five months is there for or not, I'm not really sure, but I think either one of those uh, would, would make sense, okay? Yeah, from what I've read about scorpions in the Bible lands, they don't kill you. So it's not like, you know, um, it's not like a, a pit viper, like a fear to lance or something. They're like, if you get bit, it's like the 10 step, like, well, sorry, buddy, like you're out of luck, right? So scorpions, it's kind of like, uh, I was talking to Larry about him getting stung by it with 20 hornets or something like that. Like that tormented him, right? But it didn't, of course, it would kill some, some people, but it didn't kill him, right? So. The idea here is that these locusts are going to torment the people but not kill them, right? As we go through the chapter, you're going to see these aren't regular locusts, right? The description they're given, it's a vision. It's very clear that they're not actual locusts, right? Um, you're going to see as we get a little bit further through that. So uh, the authority is not to kill the people, so it's partial judgment, but it's just to torment them for five months, okay? Look at verse 6. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them, okay? So what we have here is this picture of Rome who's being punished, and you have this bottomless pit that's opened, right? And they have these locusts that come out, and they're going to go and torment uh, the Roman nation, okay? Look at verse 8. This is where we start to get a little bit more of a description of them. You're going to see pretty clearly they're not regular locusts, all right? So look at chapter 7. The shape of the locusts was like what? Horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Okay, um, Jeremiah 51, 27, I have in the notes. Set up a banner in the land. Blow the trumpet among the nations. Okay, it's a warning. Prepare the nations against her. Call the kingdoms together against her. Ararat, Mini, Ashkenaz, appoint a general. Cause the horses to come up like the bristling locusts. Okay, So in the Old Testament, you have Jeremiah warning, hey, an invading army is coming. They're going to come like horses, but their numbers are going to be like what? Like locusts, all right? It's like, hey, if you have a cavalry, an army coming against you with like a, a billions like locusts, you don't have any chance, right? And so that's the image that's, that's get, being given here. Okay, verse 8 is interesting. I'm sorry? Jeremiah 51, 27. That verse, if you want to read the whole context, a lot of these passages I have in the notes, like the whole chapter has different allusions, um, but I'll just read one or two verses, sort of the, the ones I think fit the best. So, All right, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 8. They had hair, so, okay, so now we're talking about locusts that look like horses, and verse 8 says, they had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. All right, so lion's teeth. You remember one of the things in Joel chapter 1 that it said these locusts were like, this army? It said they had teeth like lions, a reference to the prophetic Old Testament language. All right, now what about women's hair, okay? This one bothered me for a long time because I wanted to try to figure it out. Now, unfortunately, sometimes you look into a certain reference, and God just doesn't tell you what it means. There's sometimes in the book of Revelation where, you know, God gives you a symbol and just doesn't tell you what it means, all right? So take this with a grain of salt, but um, I personally think this is a reference to the Parthian army, Okay. The Parthian army was an army that was just to the southeast of uh, the Caspian Sea, which is where like Afghanistan and stuff is now. And so they were a nation that Rome battled against all the way back to before the time of Christ. Um, remember in the Daniel class, we talked a little about Roman history. We talked about the first triumvirate, who was uh, Crassus, Pompey, and Julius Caesar. They were the three guys that sort of generals that ruled together. Well, Crassus was one of the guys who was wealthy. And he basically wanted to prove himself to Julius Caesar and Pompey, who were actual generals. 
Because those guys just looked at him like, he's just some rich guy with money. So Crassus decided he was going to go east of the Euphrates and he was going to conquer Parthia, and that's actually where he died. So when we studied Daniel, we talked about how he died, and this is the people that he died trying to fight, was the Parthians. So the Parthians were never conquered by Rome. Um, they lasted maybe two or 300 years uh, B.C. before they were conquered. But they were in the area of Persia, okay? So this is a nation that fought against Rome. I mean, I've got in the notes, at the end of chapter 9's notes, a whole bunch of excerpts from encyclopedias and different on, uh, online resources about the nation of Parthia, if you want to read about that. But I have, this is an interesting excerpt um, up from Plutarch. Uh, Plutarch was a historian, okay, a, a first century writer in Rome. And he has a writing called Crassus, which is the guy who died fighting Parthia. And this is what he wrote, uh, wrote about the Romans fighting the Parthians. And this is all in the notes, this whole long quote from this, this historical document. It says, while the Romans were in consternation, suddenly their enemies dropped the coverings of their armor Okay, now listen to all this language that it describes the Parthians, okay? They were seen to be blazing in helmets and breastplates, their steel glittering keen and bright, their horses clad in plates of bronze and steel. Serena, however, was the tallest and fairest of them all. His, effu his effeminate beauty, okay? So he's saying this leader of the Parthians looked like is effeminate, right? Okay? His effeminate beauty did not well correspond to his reputation for valor, but he was dressed in the Median fashion, with painted face and parted hair, while the rest of the Parthians still wore their hair long and bunched over their foreheads in Scythian fashion to make themselves look formidable. At first they purposed to charge upon the Romans, but with their long spears, and throw their front ranks into confusion. But whenever they saw the depth of their formation, it goes on to talk about the rest of the battle. So when you look back at uh, a nation... I don't know. Is this what the, the reference to them having long hair like women's was? Uh, I don't know. But it's interesting to me, at least, that when you look at historically, that's how the Parthians wore their hair. That's how they went into battle. They looked effeminate, as this is what this historian says, right? So many, including myself, believe that this locust army is reference to the Parthian army, who's going to be a threat that fights against Rome. Uh, and does play a part in their demise over the next couple hundred years before Rome finally falls. Okay? I've got more notes if you want to read about that um, in, in the notes. Look at verse 9. Listen to some of this language. Tell me if this, to me at least, it makes me think of what he, that writing we just read. Verse 9. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running to battle. Verse 10. Now this is where you continue the figurative language. Okay? They had tails like scorpions and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men, how long? Five months, okay? Now, is this literal? You're in chapter 9. Look, somebody look and read a Revelation 9, 19. Revelation 9, 19. And in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents. Serpents, that's right. And with them... They were to do hurt. Okay, so in verse 19, the tails are like what? Serpents. Verse 19, serpents. In verse 10, they're what? Scorpions. All right, so obviously they're, they're, you describe this locust army that looks like horses, that has lion's teeth, and it has tails like scorpions here and like serpents here. It's not literal language, okay? It's not saying, well, they were serpents and then magically their tails were transformed, okay? It's just giving you all these signs that this is symbolic language, okay? And just like the Old Testament prophets, it's using this reference to locusts and horses to talk about an invading army, okay? So verse 10, they had tails like scorpions. Their power was to hurt men for five months. Is this talking about an incomplete period of time or the length of a locust life? Either way, I think it still conveys the same, which is this is not final judgment. It doesn't kill them. It's just temporary judgment. And you'll see at the end of chapter 9, the whole purpose of this is God punishing people to try to get them to repent. Okay, verse uh, 11. They had over them a king. They had as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Okay, so who is the angel of the bottomless pit? Um, some people think, well, look, this is, this is Satan. Okay, Satan is leading this evil force against the nation of Rome. Um, some people think that it's God's destroying angel. Remember in the Old Testament, 
uh, whenever God had the tenth plague on Egypt, whenever they had to mark the house, if you didn't mark your house, your doorpost with the blood, then who was going to come kill your firstborn? God's destroying angel, right? So there's different people that take different views. Some say, well, this is God's destroying angel. Some say, well, it can't be. Uh, it has to be the devil. I, I, I really don't. I'm not going to argue with somebody for 10 minutes over who it is, right? That's really not. The point is, is what? Rome is going to be judged, okay? I've got more notes in here, uh, verses about God's destroying angel. Um, here's what I have for Exodus. God's destroying angel, question mark, possibly. Seems like this angel is using evil human forces, Parthia, to punish Rome. God did this repeatedly in the Old Testament. He used Assyria. God used Assyria to punish the northern kingdom, and he used uh, Babylon to punish the southern kingdom. So God, throughout the Old Testament, has used wicked nations like Parthia to punish another nation, okay? Um, I've got more in the notes. Some people say, well, is this talking about Domitian? Because Domitian claimed, Domitian's a Roman emperor, okay, that persecuted Christians. He claimed to be an incarnation of the god Apollo. Uh, I don't think that makes sense because Rome is the one being punished, not doing the punishing, okay? So I don't think it's Domitian. All right, verse 12. One woe is past. Remember the end of chapter... Seven or eight, it said that an, angel, an eagle flew through and said, there's going to be three woes, right? The first woe was these locusts that didn't kill them, they just harmed them, okay? So it's still temporary punishment. God is giving these people time to repent. And then this is the, uh, verse 12, one woe is past, there's still two more woes, okay, that are going to come. Verse 13, the sixth angel sounded, his what? His trumpet, right? Remember, we're in the seven trumpets right now, okay? He sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, okay? Remember in chapter 7, you had the, 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 the angels, the four winds, and they were told to what? Hold the wind back until God could do what? Mark his people for protection, Okay? So verse 14, uh, release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates, okay? Now, what, I'll ask this question, see if anybody knows. What does the river Euphrates, uh, what's the relevance of that in the Old Testament? Okay, Garden of Eden seemed to be in that area. Babylon. Who, who, whenever you cross the Euphrates, who are some of the Old Testament nations that were from there? Babylon. Persia, Assyria, all these great nations who did what? Were they buddy buddies with uh, Israel? No, they're the ones that conquered, killed, took over. So Euphrates was sort of like almost this gate to the east where all these nations from the east were the ones that came over and constantly persecuted and punished Israel in the Old Testament, okay? And the context here, who's being punished? Rome is, okay? So look at this. I've got all these notes, Old Testament notes about this is the river Babylon, Assyria, Old Testament enemies had to cross to attack. Uh, and I've got all these Old Testament passages you can look up in the notes. Um, now for Rome, the Euphrates River was also the border between their kingdom and guess whose kingdom? Parthia. That's my take on it, okay? That's historically who was on the other side of the Euphrates, okay? Verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. I think this, when it gives the hour, day, month, and year, they've been prepared for this, right? We know that God knows the future, but we also have free will, which if any of you all have figured that out yet, come and talk to me, because there's things about God that still sort of baffle my mind. How I can have free will to make decisions, but God still knows what's going to happen in the future, okay? That's why he's God. So they've been prepared, held just for this time, okay? They kill one-third of mankind. Remember when we started in chapter 6 with the seals? What, what a percentage, what fraction were they punished? One-fourth, and then it went to what? One-third, which is still partial, okay? But it's increasing until what's going to happen finally. It's going to be final judgment eventually, but God's given people time to repent, okay? Verse 16, now the number of the army of the horsemen. So in verse 15, you see there's four angels, okay? Now in verse 16, you see that these angels, what? They have an army with them. The number of the army of the horsemen was what? Okay, some translations say 200 million, probably most people in here. Does anyone else have a translation that says something different? 
It's the same number, it's just worded differently. What did someone say? 200,000, thousand, that's a good one. Um, the, the Hebrew, or the Greek, says twice, so two. Remember in the book we said two is a number for what? Like strengthening two witnesses. When Jesus sent people out, he sent them by twos. So in the Greek, it's actually the number two, twice, and then myriad, myriad. And myriad means 10,000. So it's two times 10,000 times 10,000. Now that's, that's 200 million, okay? That's, that's not a wrong translation. It's just a little bit more like sort of generalized. And so it, this basically, the 10,000, the myriad, um, or the myriad, myriad, 100,000, some people say is the greatest, the highest number in Greek. So it's almost like saying in Greek, the writer's trying to say the biggest number that you can ever have doubled, right? Like in, what's the biggest number you've known? Well, I remember like a gillion or it was like a one with 100 zeros or something. I remember as being a kid when you thought that kind of stuff was neat to know, right? So it's basically in Greek, he's saying it's twice the biggest number you can think of, and that's this army that's coming against the nation of who? Rome, okay? Um, somebody did the math and said this would be cavalry one mile wide for 85 miles long, right? So what, here, how far is Jackson? Like, is it 80 miles? Jack oh, sorry, Jackson, Tennessee. About right? Okay, so imagine a cavalry of an army of horsemen one mile wide from here to Jackson, Tennessee, right? I mean, or halfway to Jackson, Mississippi. I mean, that, that's a massive army, okay? And so, this is not a literal number, okay? I've got more notes about the size of this army, okay? Um, this is historically, this, I, this is interesting to me. The first 100,000-man army was in 1250 B.C. by Egypt, Ramses II, okay? Um, Genghis Khan in the late 13th century, was the first man to have a million-man army, okay? Um, in World War I, you know, Russia had 6 million, Germany had 4, the Allied forces had 42 million, okay? In World War II, uh, the U.S. had 12 million men, the Soviet had 11, and Germany, at their largest in 1943, had 11 million. Now, Rome, at the peak of their military army, had about half a million, 500,000 men. So imagine you're Rome, and you've got this figurative army of how many? 200 million coming against you. What's the point that God's getting across? Yeah, he's, he's going to win. He's powerful. He's got all these armies at his disposal, okay? So I have all those in the, in the notes as well about some of the writers like Tacitus who told you how big the Roman army was. Okay, verse 17. I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of what? Lions, not literal horses, it's a vision, okay? And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. Um, in the Old Testament, when God destroyed Go uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent what? Fire and brimstone, okay? All these Old Testament figures showing God's power, his destruction against wicked nations, all right? Verse 18, by these three plagues, fire, smoke, and brimstone, a third of mankind was what? Killed. And the last one with the locusts, the first time they were just what? Tormented. They wanted to die, but they weren't going to die. Now what actually happens to them? They're actually killed. By the fire and the smoke and the brimstone. Those are the three plagues. For the power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like what? Serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. Why were they scorpions before and serpents now? Well, apparently scorpions, when they sting you, don't kill you. But what happens when you get bit by some snakes? Yeah, some of them kill you, okay? Verse 20. Here, here is the point of all of these punishments against Rome. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, the two-thirds that didn't die, they did not, what? Repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Okay. Now, uh, as we go through the book, I've told you many times I think this is punishment on Rome. There's some guys that I highly respect that believe it's Jerusalem, this is one little thing why I don't think it's Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, Jerusalem struggled with what? Idolatry. In the New Testament, do you see much? No, they didn't really struggle, it seems like, much with idolatry. Okay? Um, but anyway, the rest of the mankind that did not repent, that's what God's whole purpose was, to get them to repent. And they didn't repent. So after God's given them chance after chance after chance to repent, and they don't repent, what's going to happen? He's going to finally bring the final judgment. He said, look, I am long-suffering, wishing that all would repent, come to knowledge of the truth, 2 Peter 3, 9, 
but you've had your chance, you didn't repent, and now it's time for me to actually bring final judgment on Rome, okay? Verse 21, they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Um, this is just a quote I have from a guy named uh, uh, Edward Gibbon, who wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, and he talks about, in that book, what historically caused Rome to fall. This is an excerpt, he says. This completes the three instruments running like a thread throughout the entire work by Gibbon, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It is true that three great things combined to overthrow the Roman Empire that were partly working in John's day. Natural calamity, okay, a lot of natural disasters, which is interesting how it talks in the four, fourth trumpet about mountains falling into the sea. That's why some people think Vesuvius and things like that, okay? Um, Natural calamity, internal rottenness, okay, the, the decline of their morality, which John just talked about, okay, and external invasion, Parthia, the Gauls, all the, the, the nations. As Rome spread, they tried to basically do what? Keep expanding. And as you keep expanding, you have a limited number of resources, you're going to what? You're going to weaken. Yeah, they go up into Europe and try to, to take over all the pagan hordes, and eventually they just couldn't maintain it, right? They had enemies on their east like Parthia that just kept poking and prodding and fighting, okay? All these are symbolized in Revelation as instruments ready for God's use to rescue his people. Natural calamity, flood, earthquake, volcanic eruption, internal rottenness, a long line of corrupt, uh, morally depraved rulers, and external invasion from new and old armies combined to overthrow what appeared to be so uh, invincible. Uh, in my chapter 9 notes, which will be in the Word document, at this point I have Appendix A, which is all kinds of different information about the nation uh, of Parthia. All right. Let's try to get a little bit done in Revelation chapter 10. Anybody have any questions about chapter 9 before we go on? If you do and you just don't want to ask them to the class, that's fine. Just talk to me uh, afterwards. Okay. So Revelation chapter 10. So remember before when the people in chapter 7 were sealed, it was before you had the six seals and then God's people were saying, hey, I want to reassure you, you're going to be protected and then the seventh seal was given. Up to this point, we've had how many trumpets? Six. And then you're going to have another vision just like that where God says, hey, wait, before I give you the seventh trumpet, God's going to reassure his people of protection again, okay? So chapter 10, look at verse 1. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun. His feet were like pillars of fire. Verse 2. He had a little book open in his hand. He set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Okay, what's it mean, the left foot on the, or was it? Right foot on the sea, left on the land. Well, in a few chapters, you're going to have some beasts that rise up, representing Rome, and we'll talk about that later. One of them comes up out of the what? Sea, and one of them comes up out of the land, okay? Is this the way of trying to say, hey, this message is for everybody? Uh, no matter where you are, God's going to protect you, the whole world? I think all those would be good explanations if, if somebody gave those to me, Okay. So he's got this little book in his hand, okay? Um, this message is for the entire world, okay? Verse 3, he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices, okay? Now, in the Old Testament, the Bible all the time talks about God speaking like a lion roaring, like thundering, okay? So that's just God's powerful message. Verse 4, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. Remember, in, in the beginning of the book, John was told to do what? Write the vision, okay? So he was about to write what he saw, but then another voice from heaven said, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them, okay? There's some things that John saw that God says what? You don't need to know it. You know, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the secret things are God's, but then there's other things he's revealed to us by his spirit, right? 1 Corinthians 2, 11, I think. No, it's close. It's in that area. Um, talks about how you can't know the mind of man unless it reveals, and that's how God has revealed things to us through his spirit, right? There's some stuff that, that Paul, he was caught up to the third heaven, and he was not allowed to do what? Wasn't allowed to talk about it, right? So when I see on the internet some guys like, I died and went to heaven, and God gave me this message, and I came back, and this is what it is. I'm always a little skeptical of that, because if God wouldn't let the apostle Paul write about it, or the apostle John, why do I think he's going to let this guy 15 years ago write about it, Okay. Plus, half the time, the things those guys say don't match up with the Bible anyway, which is sort of a big tell that they're, that they're not being truthful, okay? So God says, don't write them. Don't write the thunders, okay? Verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea 
and on the land, raised up his hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea, the things that are in that, that there should be what? Delay no longer. Up to this point, God's been holding off on final judgment from Rome. But now what? He's not holding it off anymore. He says, I've been holding off this final judgment on Rome, but it's over. They had the time to repent. They didn't, and so the final judgment uh, is going to come. Verse 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, sounding his trumpet, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished, and as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Okay. Um, I have a lot of notes here about this Greek word, uh, mystery, mysterion. It's used in the New Testament for lots of different things. Uh, in Ephesians, it's talking about God's mystery was that the Gentiles would also come into the church, right? Here, uh, what I think it's referencing is what's the context? Punishment on who? Rome. In the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, it talked about how the little horn, which is Domitian, would make war on the saints, right? In Daniel 2, remember Daniel had that vision of the big statue, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the fourth kingdom, which is who? And it said God's kingdom would come and do what to that statue? Destroy it. God's kingdom is the church. So when it says this mystery that was revealed through the prophets, I think he's saying, hey, Daniel wrote about this. Daniel wrote about a nation that was going to persecute the church, and the church was going to triumph over it, okay? So that's what I think it's talking about in verse 7. I've got a lot more explaining notes, uh, moving a little bit slower, okay, in the notes. Verse 8, the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me and said, go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and the earth. Verse 9, so I went to the angel and said, give me the little book. And he said, the angel said, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Now, we'll sort of hang on this verse and pick up in this verse next week. Does anybody remember an Old Testament story this sounds a whole lot like? One of the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Uh, maybe next week we might start off class. Well, i got four minutes. Uh, let's do that. Let's go back in your Bibles to Ezekiel. Okay. If you want to look that up, do you, is it the chapter or the verse? Look it up. We'll have you read that here in a second. So basically what's happening in chapter 10 is there's an angel with a little book, and he's going to give it to John and tell him to what? Eat it, okay? Go to Ezekiel chapter 2. In Ezekiel chapter 2, the context of Ezekiel in the Old Testament is God's punishing Jerusalem, right? Because all the abominations. He's going to give Ezekiel visions of, hey, while you're in Babylon in the second deportation, there's still a lot of abominations going on in Jerusalem, right? In the temple. People are setting up idols in the temple. And God says, I'm going to wipe them out with Nebuchadnezzar in 586. I'm going to destroy the temple because how wicked the people are there, right? So in Ezekiel chapter 2, listen to this. When I saw it, this is Ezekiel, I fell on my face. I heard a voice as of one speaking. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet. I will speak to you. The Spirit entered me when he spoke and set me on my feet. I heard him who spoke to me. He said, Son of man, I'm sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious house that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. For they are impudent and stubborn children. I'm sending you to them, and you shall say, Thus says the Lord God. As for them, whether they hear you or refuse, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Among you, son of man, do not be afraid of their words. Though briars or thorns are with you and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed at their looks. They are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and what? Eat what I give you. Verse 9, when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. He spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and outside, and the writing were what? Lamentations and mourning and woe. Is that good or bad? It's bad for Israel, right? Chapter 3 and verse 1. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go do what? Speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. 
He said to me, Son of man, feed your belly, fill your stomach with the scroll I give you. So I ate it, and it was in my mouth like what? Honey. It was sweet. Okay, so in Revelation, you have this appeal, obviously, back to a story in Ezekiel, where God is going to punish somebody, but before he punishes them, he's going to do what to the people later in chapter 9? We'll look at next week. He's going to mark other people, right? You're going to see this exact same thing in Revelation 10. He's going to say, hey, John, take this scroll, eat it. It's going to be sweet to you and bitter also. In Ezekiel later, it talks about how the message is also bitter. Why? Ezekiel is supposed to speak to Israel and say what? God's going to punish you, right? That's bitter to people that don't repent, but if people repent, it's what? Sweet. It's like if you talk to somebody today, you have a Bible study with them, and you tell them the Bible says X. It's going to be bitter or sweet based off what? Their response. If they repent and respond to it, that's sweet. And if they don't, then it's going to be bitter. And so John is about to deliver this message that's going to be sweet to the people that repent and bitter to those that don't. We'll pick up right there next week um, in, in, in uh, chapter nine, or v- chapter 10, verse 9, and we'll move through chapter 10 and chapter 11. Sign up in the back if you want the notes and to be on the email list. And um, there's only one person whose email, you, if your email is like 12OLDE something, come talk to me because that's the only email that keeps bouncing back, and I think I just have it written down wrong. So if you can let me know your right email, I can add you to the list. So I'm sorry, whoever it is, but come talk to me.